wouldn't you say? <laughs> but certainly appreciate it. It is indeed my great honor to have the opportunity to be with all of you here this eve and to hopefully engage you in discourse. I look forward to a little bit later in this evening when we shall be able to take some questions from you because there is no more important thing for the chief magistrate of the nation than to entertain the questions, curiosities, and conundrums of his fellow citizens. I must also tell you that I am greatly honored to be here in the Northwest Territories, <laughs> which is curious to me considering I, I don't think I've ever been beyond the Ohio Valley before. Do you have any idea how many days it took me to ride out here? <laughs> but that is a conversation for another time. For now, we are honoring the Constitution of these United States of America. Of course, the Constitution is the document that fulfills the promise that was made by our Declaration of American Independence. But I will also tell you that my mind spins back to an even earlier time. Mrs. Washington will tell you that depending on how one looks at the coin, I am either blessed or cursed. And that is because I tend to remember everything. For example, I remember being a very loyal and happy British subject. Now that might be surprising to many of you, but it was the case. We had all the rights and privileges and franchises of Englishmen, at least those that were important to us, and our lordly masters in Great Britain pretty much left us alone here in British America, the American colonies, for nigh on 150 years, going back to the 1600s. I was such a loyal subject that I served His Majesty. I fought for king and country during the Seven Years' War, although it had a bit of a different name here in British America. You know the name? The French and Indian War. I actually served as an officer in the Virginia Regiment. I was hailed a hero, although if truth be told, what, much of what I was hailed a hero for came out of the, the brash acts of being such a youthful officer. I wrote to one of my brothers, a younger brother, after a battle I had led against the French. I wrote, I have heard the bullets whistle. And believe me, there is something charming in the sound. <laughs> That comment made it all the way back to the King of England himself. The King of England said that if Colonel Washington, I was a colonel at the time, if Colonel Washington, he said, had been hit by that bullet, his attitude would have been very different. <laughs> Ultimately, the British were successful in kicking out the French from North America, from what we clearly saw as British land. But before I resigned my commission as commander in chief of all the forces of Virginia, I would be struck, struck by the manner in which our lordly masters, and particularly the British military aristocracy, felt and treated American colonials. Do you know that as a colonel in the Virginia regiment, my orders could be overturned by a lieutenant in the British regular army. This was my first understanding of the arrogance of our British lordly masters. But it was soon forgotten. I married a fine and good lady, the widow of Colonel Daniel Custis, Martha Dandridge Custis. On 12th night, 1759, she became Mrs. Washington. We had 16 uninterrupted years at Mount Vernon. She will refer to it as the golden years. And then everything changed in 1764. My life would be turned upside down. I would be yanked out of the life of a Virginia gentleman farmer and thrust into a world, a storm, that no one could have ever predicted. What? 
caused that change. You see, it is really very simple. The king in 1764 opens up his treasury and he sees it is nigh on empty. He has a fit. He turns to his ministers, tells them to do something about it. They put their heads together and they suggest the following to the King of England. Your Majesty, we have just finished fighting a very expensive war against the French. Most of the cost of that war was incurred in British America, in the colonies. Let us turn to the American colonials. We will refill your counting room. That was a brilliant idea on face value. The problem is, however, that our Lord and Masters did not understand us in America a whit. And the second problem is they tried to achieve their means with an iron fist forced down our throats. I do not need to recount for you the 11 years of systematic tyranny, the stripping of our liberties, the usurpation of our freedoms, the constant reaching into our purses. Ultimately, we can stand it no longer. Gentlemen from 13 separate countries come together, and it is critical to your understanding of all of these events, that you are clear about the fact that we were absolute strangers to each other. You could spend your entire life in your country of Virginia and never set foot in the country of Maryland or the country of North Carolina. We come together and one thing leads to another to the point where we agree to raise up arms against our king, something that no colony in the history of humankind had ever done successfully. And we were going to do it against the most powerful fighting force in the entire world, the British Army and the British Navy. I also do not need to tell you about the outcome of that great and glorious contest. I will simply tell you that when I was commissioned as Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army, of the United Colonies of America. We would not declare independence for 13 months. I wrote a letter to my beloved Mrs. Washington. I told her, after enclosing a copy of my will, that I would be home for Christmas Eve. Wrote the letter in mid-June 1775. I would be home for Christmas Eve. I did not tell her which one. <laughs> I literally walked across the threshold of our home at Mount Vernon on Christmas Eve, eight and a half years later, without ever taking a single day's furlough during the entire War of American Independence. We as a people raise up this nation. We are successful. We defeat the British. And then we had to ask ourselves what kind of country we should be. Make no mistake about it, there were a wide range of options and opinions, including those who wanted to make me what? The king, King George I of America. You can understand this thinking, can you not? At the time that we declare our American independency on July 2nd, 1776, I'm getting some looks here. You do know that the question of our independence was voted upon on July 2nd, 1776. It was adopted on July 4th, 1776, read to the public on the 8th. Mr. John Adams said, July 2nd will long be remembered in this country with parades and illuminations. Well, he was only off by two days. But at the time we declare our American independence, and again at the time that we ratify our Constitution, we are the only country in the entirety of this world, the only country on earth, that is not under the control of men and women of absolute power. Every other nation on the planet is under the control of kings and queens and lords and ladies and sheiks and viziers and potentates and maharajas and mikados and emperors, even a tsarina.